Okay. We'll shortly be having a conversation uh, with uh, a Kenya pipeline company who recently, just um, on the 7th of April, launched a fiber optic cable service in the country and want to understand pipeline, fuel, fiber, fiber. Mm. What's the connection? How is fiber pipeline or how is pipeline fiber? Why? Is the pipeline being fed in the fiber or is the fiber being carried in the pipeline? Is the pipeline carrying the fiber? Is a, Yeah. And which fiber are you talking about? Fiber optic cable. Okay. <laughs> so City, earlier you asked, huh? um, I thought we have many fiber cables in Kenya. And yes, actually. We do. There, there, there are several. There are six submarine cables that have landed in, uh, in Kenya. One of them is the East African Marine System, TIMS, that uh, was launched in 2009. Uh, other internet cables landing in Mombasa have been easy, the one I told you, the East African Submarine Cable System, the Lower Indian Ocean Network, Lion, Seacom, the Djibouti Africa Regional Express, one day, and now there's a new one that was, was again launched just uh, this year. And this one is called the Pakistan and East Africa Connecting Europe. Peace. Hmm? Some nice names. Easy, Teams, mm -hmm. Peace, mm -hmm. Lion, mm -hmm. Simba. Seacom. Seacom. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Big, big. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's understand this entry into the fiber optic and connectivity business by Kenya Pipeline. Zilpa Michelle Abongo is a general manager for strategy and compliance at Kenya Pipeline. Good morning, Zilpa. Good morning, Eric. Good to have you on Kenya's biggest conversation. That is the hot seat, as hot as the red uh, mic that you have in front of you. But first, let's, let's first of all understand. So Kenya Pipeline, mm -hmm. what is the mandate of Kenya Pipeline mm -hmm. when it was established and as it operates today? Absolutely important question. Um, thank you all for having us. We are essentially East and Central Africa is only uh, what we call multi-product pipeline. So we transport what we call clean petroleum products, not crude oil. That will be your super uh, diesel kerosene through the pipeline to various destinations. So when the ships um, dock in Mombasa, they will uh, store, uh, discharge and store within the facilities there and then enter our pipeline through Mombasa to Nairobi, Nakuru, Eldoret and Kisumu. At uh, specifically Nakuru, Eldoret and Kisumu, they are what we call loading depots. So they're here, people bring their trucks, uh, we load for them these petroleum products into the trucks and then they go into what we call retail service stations that service your vehicles where you fuel or they will um, transport these petroleum products to manufacturers or any other facility for petroleum um, utilization or further distribution. We service the local market as well as what you call transit market, what you colloquially call export market. So that is Uganda, Burundi, Tanzania, initially um, South Sudan, DRC. So we essentially are a, a corridor within the um, what we call Northern Corridor Transit Route mm -hmm. to transport petroleum products. Have the other countries acknowledged Kenya mm -hmm. Pipeline as their sole uh, conduit for this? Or uh -huh. do they get to some point and say, this Kenya Pipeline people, they are becoming too expensive. Let's uh -huh. look for alternatives. Um, indeed, um, earlier on before 2007, KPC or Kenya Pipeline Company as it's called was a monopoly. So we pretty much moved most of the product within the region and the, the economies of these countries were dependent on us. Unfortunately, after the post-election violence, people started seeking alternative routes, which um, are fair, but they are based on road transportation. So we do have competition from trucks being uh, road tankers or from rail to a minimal extent, but Kenya Pipeline Company remains the most dominant player in the transport sector. And so for Uganda, we transport about 75% of their fuel through our system. Um, for Rwanda, we're still doing about 10%. It used to be more, almost 100. Um, we're working on uh, wing them back because there's always competition, yeah. lively we competition. Moved from 100 to 10. Imagine. That was uh, mainly because of the, the situation in 2007. Mm -hmm. So it's also a call to our, our, our people that, you know, 
the actions that we provoke after elections really do impact economies and we need to remain a stable um, transit environment so mm. that businesses can continue. Uh, and, and of course, uh, for DRC, we do about 30%. That's for East Congo. And then for um, South Sudan, we do about 90% of their distribution through this corridor. So we still firmly sit as the epicenter of petroleum distribution within the region. Mm -hmm. Let me understand this. Huh? Mm -hmm. Rwanda is landlocked. Correct. So where do they get their fuel from, if not from us? Currently, Tanzania. So they transit through Uganda. It's a really long route. Indeed very long route so what we are working on is rebuilding confidence because truly petroleum transportation through pipeline is world over the most efficient the most effective most reliable um however you know when your economy is disrupted by anything uh, looking like uh, it could lead to war then countries then have a, a psychological shift which is what we've been trying to break. But Rwanda remains within our pipeline system, especially for the airport uh, distribution of jet fuel. Mm. Jet fuel is what then f uh, is into plane aircraft uh, petrol, uh, petroleum product. But we are working harder because we do appreciate that this could be a bigger percentage. So Tanzania has the equivalent of a Kenya pipeline company? No, it does not. It has so, so they rely on road transport and rail transport? Correct. Mostly which, road, actually. Which is less efficient than the pipeline. Absolutely. We goofed badly there, didn't we? Mm. <laughs> so it's actually a message to our brothers wow. to consider their actions. Now, uh -huh. so locally, uh -huh. your competition is road and rail. Yes, but rail to a very minimal extent because we were using what we call the meter gauge railway, mm -hmm. which, um, as you would know, takes longer than going over the transport system. And then the connectivity into Uganda, for instance, is only localized to a place called Port Bell mm -hmm. because you have to then transship again, move it into a track to go into a place called Ginger. So the, the, the rail network has not been as fluid as uh, we would say pipeline definitely or even road because you know with road you take it exactly to where you want it yeah, yeah. i want to ask a question out of ignorance mm -hmm. petrol fuel gets to mombasa mm -hmm. pumped into storage facilities Absolutely. enters the system mm -hmm. it then travels mm -hmm. How many kilometers per hour before it gets to where it's going? A thousand meters. Uh, we tell we usually say it travels at a thousand cubes or what we call a million liters per hour, and it travels 450 kilometers from Mombasa to Nairobi, and then another continuous about 350 to Kisumu. So, so around in two hours, uh -huh. two million. It has done that. Yes. Things fast. Work. Then the second question, then actually uh, aligned to that. Uh -huh. So it's the same pipeline uh -huh. that is transporting kerosene. Uh -huh. Super petrol. Absolutely. Diesel. Absolutely. Jet fuel. Absolutely. Adulteration. <laughs> How do you avoid that? <laughs> Yeah, in fact, some people uh, in the region think it's magical, you know, how we manage to do that. So by some serious physics, we're able to create enough pressure within that pipeline that they are what would we essentially compartmentalize those products in batches or compartments within the pipeline system. So there's a, a, um, a methodology that we would use. I think that's the best word to, to use where, um, for instance, diesel and super have what we call a non-critical interface such that even if they touch each other side by side within the pipeline, we can somehow manage by density to separate these two. So they, so they do not mix. They do not mix. Okay. And even that little interface, because you see it's a liquid product that mm. touches each other, we are able to separate them and then re-inject into the diesel such that it is actually not affected in terms of composition. And then, for instance, kerosene and uh, super cannot mix because of the, the, com the chemistry. You are aware that you've just described for us an, uh, an adulteration process. <laughs> no, it's not, actually. <laughs> so the product that comes out of our depot facilities mm. is certified again. So you see, when it comes okay. into the into the port of Mombasa, yeah. it is inspected. You see, it was inspected at the load port, whether mm. it's in Dubai or mm. India or wherever. Mm. And then when it lands in Mombasa, it is re-inspected for quality against the KEB standard and against what KPC has as its own internal standard, because we know we have to manage these critical interfaces. Once it gets into the pipeline, there's a monitoring system. And actually, one of these days, you should visit our control rooms. It's, it's really, really quite exciting. When? Now, you see, it's, um, Monday... 
Wow. <laughs> it, it will be quite exciting for you to see how it moves within that pipeline system. Mm. We monitor each product as it's going along and we actually monitor that critical interface to avoid any kind of critical mixing. When it gets into um, the system, up to Eldoret Kisumu as it's exiting, it is again tested for quality. So you do not ever have a situation where we give you product below the Kenyan spec and below the KPC spec. And it's actually issued, for instance, to the export companies, mm. I mean customers, to the spec of the country that it's going to. The beauty is Kenya has a higher spec. There's a kink that I came across sometimes back in the media. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't working in the media space as we call it then mm -hmm. but i came across it mm -hmm. water mm -hmm. somewhere along the line there were issues it was at the, the kisumu depot uh, mm. that time that time mm. <laughs> i was working in that region and i came across this mm -hmm. some people went to get their fuel and instead got water mm. what role does at water pump. yeah yes they, they they filled their tanks with the vehicle with water now i want to know the role of water because mm -hmm. Water must be a key component in this process. Mm -hmm. What does water do? Mm -hmm. And what mistake occurred? Because mm -hmm. clearly this was a mistake. Mm -hmm. Something happened that wasn't supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. And there was this problem. Mm -hmm. Kindly walk us through this. Um, every morning, there's supposed to be what we call a tank draining process. So at the, at the tank bottom, at the base of the tank, there will be a process by which water which is denser than most of the fuel products all of them actually will sink to the bottom if any because um within uh, the petroleum distillation process there could be some molecules not even recognizable to you by eye visually so if indeed there's any sort of entrance of this into the tank for instance whatever mechanism because some have floating roofs others have flat roofs or within the pipeline system, which is quite unlikely, then it will sink to the bottom of the tank and there's supposed to be a draining process every day as part of what we call our standard operating procedures that would then exit or egress the water from the facility. So in this particular situation, there was indeed a mistake. It was not done as per the procedure. And unfortunately, it was also not checked by the team that was there. So by the time it was being noted, it was unfortunately by the customer as opposed to by us, which is not what is supposed to happen. So indeed, there had to be administrative action mm. taken because that is absolutely unacceptable in any shape or form. And Kenya Pipeline Company did the necessary rearrangements within its um, organizational structure to ensure that that doesn't happen. Those appropriate sanction. Sure. So, Zilpa, just from what you described, I mean, it, the, the intricacies of how this entire system works, mm -hmm. making sure that, you know, everybody gets their fuel needs around the country. Mm -hmm. It seems like you have your hands full. Absolutely. And so now here we are talking about fiber, fiber. optic. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it seems like worlds apart. Mm -hmm. So where is this all? How does this all then now? Segue into each other. Yes. So in 2002, there was a vision that um, for our own data carriage needs, because considering the sort of installations that we run, they have uh, very many systems that control them. So for instance, when I've told you about the control room, that's a system in itself. Mm -hmm. When we tell you about loading, that's a system in itself. They need to communicate with each other. Aside from that, we have a lot of storage needs. We have a lot of connectivity needs because we serve the whole country. We're literally at every major city in the country. We needed a fiber cable that was reliable. So m this is actually not uncommon in pipeline installations or in major um, industry. We laid it, but then thought, why on earth would we lay fiber cable with capacity just for ourselves? How about we lay it with capacity for expansion? Mm -hmm. So as KPC grew um, through the years, because you would know from then, we have built other pipelines to augment the one that we had built in 1978 called Line 1, which is now decom being decommissioned. So these pipelines all also needed to con co communicate with each other. So it was agreed as a policy that for every pipeline we would lay we would also lay fiber optic cable or cabling when we got to 2000 about 2018 it was realized that our capacity was actually excess now we had a cable with 96 cores these are like the lines that transmit 
data, but we do not have data within them, only for our own needs, that needed now to be um, commercialized because you cannot sit on excess cabling for the entirety mm -hmm. of the period of this company's existence. Mm -hmm. So there was a very brilliant idea off of some work we did with a consultant within the ICT space because, you know, we were energy and, and, and not in the, um, in, the, in the business of communication. Who, where we were advised that you could actually lease off this fiber cable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this had actually happened off of Vision 2030, where was a, there was a push to increase internet access to everybody in Kenya mm -hmm. to ensure that our economy can actually grow at a faster rate. So mm -hmm. industrialization, but as well as technology. So we are, uh, got acquired a tier two network infrastructure license. Uh, a tier two network infrastructure. We will explain what that is, but go on. Okay. Uh, from the Communications Authority of Kenya, mm -hmm. <coughs> whereby there are actually different categories of um, licenses that you can obtain. Some people just operate as internet service providers, so that's a lower tier. Others, like Safaricom, have an even higher um, um, ranking whereby you can lay infrastructure as well as have data carriage, bandwidth carriage, so I can provide you then in that cat in, uh, category with internet. Mm -hmm. And they can also move across countries. So for instance, I can connect satellite network with the submarine cables that Eric was talking about into another country. That's a whole other sphere in itself. So <clears throat> from 2018, then we started to prospect for clients because who are we going to sell this fiber optic cable to? Thankfully, and um, I, I really appreciate the ICT space it is very switched on. So when they had that KPC had fiber optic cable came in and assessed the quality of it, um, their stretch across the country of it. Um, I won't go into all the technical details, but you can connect at every point in the country. They felt this is actually a very good product. So mm -hmm. Safaricom um, jumped on, then Jamie Telcom jumped on, then Wananchi uh, uh, group that um, Zuku jumped on, and then we just started, it, it started being um, a movement, I would call it. So <clears throat> the aspects of now leasing, commercializing this were seen as now commercial or marketing function, business development wise. So it then was espoused into our strategy as not just being for systems and processes, let this actually be a revenue stream. Mm -hmm. So then the marketing team started prospecting for even more clients. Mm -hmm. And then this year in on April 7th, we launched it uh, on a very large scale with uh, CS Mosheru there, the CAK, CG, uh, Chiro Chiloba there. And what we end up, essentially our whole company saying that whatever infrastructure is in the company, in the country, KPC has some of the best that mm -hmm. you can get in terms of the connectivity of this line, quality-wise, as well as the reliability. So in the tech space, is something called uptime. So how many times is your fiber cabling interrupted by cuts, what we call fiber cuts? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately or fortunately for us, we have that extreme advantage of not our line cannot be intruded upon unless by vandals where, you know, it's out of our control and unplanned, of course, severe acts of terrorism because our line is heavily manned. So by both human beings, by systems, as well as by aerial surveillance. So if there's a fiber cut, it's because we accessed the line that's or because somebody has deliberately accessed correct it. Mm. so we only access our what we call our way leave our right of way mm. when we are doing any kind of maintenance on our pipeline so this fiber cable is laid beneath our pipeline system mm -hmm. so for you to access it beyond our pipeline you're really going out of your way and the only people who can do that are we through excavators mm. so when we are doing planned maintenance we would advise our customers this is what's happening so Likely you will not have a fiber cut, but in the event you do, we will fix it immediately. So in a whole year, in fact, the most I've had of is two fiber cuts. What does that result in? 99.6% uptime. Mm. That means that if you your backbone is KPC fiber, your likelihood of having internet outage is almost is pretty much okay, non-existent so, exactly mm -hmm. so we're looking at raising that uptime to 99.9 .9, which is essentially the highest mm -hmm. in the industry that you can acquire okay. and that would require that mm -hmm. um we we manage our maintenance such that essentially no one can touch this line and that's a processing experience mm -hmm. so that uh the guys because you know the the maintenance is handled by the mechanical team mm -hmm. uh the fiber is handled by 
instrumentation and control sometimes something can happen or if it's unavoidable but that is uh, something that we're actually looking in the next financial year to cut completely mm -hmm. so the customers have now increased now we have airtel we have mtn we even have uh, other companies that i guess i should not talk about at mm -hmm. the moment because they're in the process of onboarding mm -hmm. whether <laughs> large telecommunications companies or internet service providers that are coming in and then there's opportunity you mentioned the mm -hmm. peace cable to connect a submarine cable to a terrestrial one like Kenya Fiber, Kenya Pipeline Company's Fiber. So the connectivity then is even more enhanced towards um, Eldoret and Kisumu. What then that also means is if we expand our infrastructure to Busia, we can connect directly into Uganda and eventually into Rwanda and the Congo. You so one of the submarine cables can basically mm -hmm. move to the border with Uganda. Yes. So Uganda can feel like it has landed exactly. a submarine cable exactly. in Busia. Exactly. Let's talk. Let's take a break. <laughs> I know you have a question. No, Andu has many questions. Uh, it's just, just let's let's just take a break. This is the Situation Room. It continues. Eric Latif, Andu Okol, CT Muga, Zilpa Michelle Abongo from Kenya Pipeline Company. We are talking about Kenya Pipeline's entry into commercial fiber optic cable business. Andu, question number seven A one. Wow. Okay. So Zilpa, <laughs> for 20 marks. Okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> you talked about uh, Vision 2030 mm -hmm. and there's all Vision 2025. Mm -hmm. So are you looking at this as a contribution mm -hmm. towards that vision mm -hmm. or value added service mm -hmm. that uh, KPC now is offering saying, well, look, I mean, obviously there's a commercial value here mm -hmm. for the company. Mm -hmm. But is there, can we see a coloring within the same spaces then of contributing towards the country's vision? Absolutely. Um, in fact, the vision for the country preceded our own commercial interests. So Vision 2030 was um, domesticated into KPC's um, agenda through what we call Vision 2025. That's our corporate strategic plan. And within it, connectivity was key. <clears throat> so as I said, it evolved from being our own connectivity to grand connectivity within the country. So some state corporations were charged with actually then laying fiber infrastructure when the government realized that, you know, under its uh, master plan, this could be actually be done through the government agencies so alongside Konza Technopolis which you know is doing extremely well now in terms of being a data center eventually um, upping storage capacity connecting with private companies KPC <coughs> offers an opportunity <coughs> pardon me, to connect Bless into Kanza Technopolis, where various firms now have another node to light up their fiber from. So the government through agencies like Kenya Pipeline Company is looking at one, making internet more accessible. That's across the country. And that's why they're looking at, say, for instance, Kenya Pipeline distributing from Mombasa to Eldoret and Kisumu so that everyone along that connecting point can pick up and drop off internet. Two, it is looking at making it cheaper. Mm -hmm. So when you have more players in the market, you're able to cause some level of disruption that makes the market more competitive. So with more backbone, and that's why you're seeing so many submarine cables are landing here. In any case, Kenya is an extremely vibrant testing hub for Eastern Central Africa, for most of these large corporations. I mean, Microsoft is here, Amazon Warehouse um, Storage Services is here for cloud computing. Google. We have Google now setting up a whole innovation hub and engineering center. Facebook has been here. So with all these companies connecting into East Africa through Kenya, um, we essentially then are providing further gateways for this to happen on a larger scale. With that, you will definitely have more accessible and cheaper internet in your homes. That then enables you as a small and medium enterprise or as a sole proprietor to set up a business, to communicate across the world, to engage with your families. I even say that even Mamamboga, aside from the work that is being done by telcos in terms of airtime connectivity, is now able to access data and you see packages of one day, five minutes or whatever it is. That one you hour. One hour even, exactly, mm -hmm. to watch um, View Sasa you mentioned mm -hmm. and then what's the other one? Show Max. <laughs> Show Max, exactly. Um, therefore, this is an opportunity for this economy within this segment mm -hmm. to actually participate in the global, glo global spectrum. And I anticipate that even more creative um, technologies will be developed here because you do know Kenya has been quite um, on the forefront of developing innovations in the world. You talked about tier two and that's uh, then city <coughs> said, said you'll explain it. Mm -hmm. Please explain this mm -hmm. tier two license mm -hmm. from the communications authority. Mm -hmm. What is it? How many tiers are there? Mm -hmm. So we have um, the mandate 
to lay infrastructure only. So if you wanted to do anything more, for instance, either sell you internet or connect to another country, we would have to acquire another license. The license we would need now is tier one. That is the highest, most supreme. And as I mentioned, uh, country, companies like Safaricom are the ones who have that sort of um, inf um, licensing. Beyond infrastructure, you now have um, connectivity in simple into terms. Homes. Into homes, exactly. Okay. And um, beneath that, then there's a the guys who can o not lay infrastructure. They can only provide you internet services. So um, potentially because of capital constrictions or possibly that is not their segment. They're not interested in networks. And that's okay because in the tech space everybody has a place to play mm -hmm. so you're either on the retail end the wholesale end the infrastructure end or you're in all of them and then you can essentially capture the whole market so kpc of course had an entry at an infrastructure level because we are not internet service providers neither were we trying to access the retail market because just like with the petroleum model I hope you, you know, maybe I didn't mention this, we do not retail to you at any point. We have no interface with the end user or the common mana inchi, other than by being the conduit through which petroleum products pass. So you are the sort of organization <coughs> that come Christmas, you don't give petroleum gifts at to you. At all, <laughs> at all. In fact, we give Christmas vouchers. <laughs> you know, was reading out for that request. <laughs> And the weird, the strangest part is even our family think that we, you know, can mark and sell petroleum products. Barrel, we don't even do barrels. Do barrel. <laughs> no, you, you, you it's do. bulk in the pipeline. Wow. Barrels, oh my goodness, unless you're going to maybe countries like Somalia, mm. you're not going to get barrels. <laughs> or uh, for like um, Manda Bay in, in Lamu, they do um, barrel. have barrels for the jet fuel. So just the same way, our mm. fiber was supposed to be through it's just we are just a just conduit set up the we, that's why we, and that's it exactly and that is what is called dark fiber d-a-r-k meaning it is hollow there's nothing in that cable so anybody who leases our fiber mm. which is at 22 dollars per kilometer per fiber core out of the 96 of which we've almost sold 10 at least 10 not sold um is then able to light it what when we when i said konza has terminal equipment they are able to provide um frequencies through which you can distribute data within that dark fiber core to wherever it is that you intend. It's a technology in itself and that's what is called fiber optics. Right. Exactly. So the optics are part of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So mm -hmm. with this strategy, um, the Kenya Pipeline Strategy 2025 mm -hmm. and you're the boss of strategy, mm -hmm. is there a strategy to seek the other tiers of licensing mm -hmm. now that you have the infrastructure and mm -hmm. you're seeing what's happening mm -hmm. can you seek for example the authority of the communications authority to mm -hmm. uh, get deeper into the business mm -hmm. of course every business goes on its comparative advantages and up to today, 40 years later, we have never touched the retail end of distribution. One, there was a company called National Corporation and still is there, mandated to do that. Two, because when you start um, engaging in areas where you do not know mm -hmm. the space, you may end up causing yourself, burning your fingers more than you actually assist yourself. It's a Kenyan thing to do. <laughs> Just copying everybody. You start a bar, you have a car wash, you have a butchery there. This is the Kenyan thing. Kenyan thing. It's a and Kenyan thing I think to do. one of the reasons we've stayed so reliable as a company <laughs> is because we've stuck to our lane. We know what it is that we do best. An extremely talented pool of engineers, mm. um, one of, some of the best in the country, and they know how to manage infrastructure. So for now, unless uh, propelled by government um, need, uh, of course, we're engaging a lot with the ICT, um, Youth Innovation and uh, Technology Ministry, as well as with Communications Authority. Where the government would need us to go further, we will. Because, mm -hmm. as you know, we are a commercial entity, commercial mm -hmm. state corporation, meaning we generate our own income. We may have more latitude to do such than uh, for instance, you know, another Paris title that's mm. fully funded by the National Treasury. Mm -hmm. However, right now, it is not within our interest because there's already so many players handling that business. Our interest is to ensure that there's access. When there's access, these players then indeed will reduce the cost of internet mm. uh, reliance to you. Is it possible for there to be a saturation of access? Not yet. Not in technology. Uh, the way we see it, and then with 5G technology coming up, 
the literally we do not have enough capacity so for in, by the way kpc with the 96 core we always say we can light up all of kenya with just those 96 cores but Careful someone needs to language <laughs> 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 but someone needs to <laughs> do that. Foot and then I said they can light Imagine. Up, can <laughs> so nine, a company would need to then take up all those cores of various companies to light up the whole um, environment, the whole economy. Those 96 cores are essentially enough for the country's needs. However, um, it's subject to this duplicity because you do know there are other fiber cables available. Right. Are they reliable? Mm. Are they good quality? How long is their lifespan? Because a fiber <coughs> optic cable has a couple of decades to it. So after which they start... This one of yours, know, how many decades does it have? It's actually very new. So it's uh, we're talking about <coughs> 40 years, 50 years going into the future. It can light up um, the whole nation. So with partners, we're looking at a partner model as opposed to us doing that. Really, even if we have some capital some little change we do not have mm. that sort of capacity that's a whole sector so then where is the propensity for suggestion here mm -hmm. because i pl just stay with me mm -hmm. a little bit because you've said mm -hmm. that your mandate is to provide mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. you're providing the access mm -hmm. and, and an environment where these things can happen mm -hmm. and you say look we're going to stick to our, our mandates mm -hmm. and you know just stay here mm -hmm. so where then are you able to make suggestions mm -hmm. in, because you've already plugged mm -hmm. into this vision mm -hmm. Or you are already plugged into the vision for mm -hmm. the country, Absolutely. right? <clears throat> and there are very many things then that are part of this vision. Mm -hmm. And I remember a time not too long ago, mm -hmm. two short years ago, mm -hmm. when the world was shut down mm -hmm. because of COVID. Mm -hmm. One of the things that suffered the most was education. Mm -hmm. Children were not able to go to school. And one of the things that we saw mm -hmm. was that, look, if every community, at least your mm -hmm. community center, your mm -hmm. town, Baraza, mm -hmm. here, there, mm -hmm. had access mm -hmm. to the internet... Mm -hmm connectivity mm -hmm. then perhaps we would see children still being able to learn even mm -hmm. if they could not congregate in schools mm -hmm. so then how do you see mm -hmm. a company being able to make a suggestion mm -hmm. to national government and say look mm -hmm. we already have this access mm -hmm. how can we make things a little bit easier mm -hmm. since we have it already mm -hmm. and since we are government anyway and, and we are part of you anyway mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Can't we see suggestions <coughs> being made mm -hmm. along the lines to then have everybody plug into this vision? Mm -hmm. This CSR component. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Indeed. <coughs> so the reason why we're also partnering with Konza Technopolis is because um, for you to even have that sort of capability, you do need to have these terminal points where these cables are like dropped so that they can connect into um, the wider system. Now, um, Konza, as you do know, is government... Um, agenda very key in in terms of lighting up our city and making it like south korea or dubai and before you can do that you cannot go into the market and start saying that we have this capability so in these connections that we're making with konza with the big telcos already in that space I'm, t I'm certain that two years down the line, three years down the line, because um, fiber is quite a fast moving business, we will then see where are the gaps. And if those gaps continue to persist in a scale that is too large for enterprise, private enterprise to continue with, I'm sure there will be policy interventions that say, you know what, government, because uh, as you do know, even like for Peace Cable Telcom, which is... Um, uh, partly government owned is involved in that mm. various guys i mean kenya power there's ketraco they also have fiber cable uh, cable connectivity so it's just a question of confluence time opportunity if um, the private sector is only able to reach a certain point then by all means government will need to intervene because at the end of the day when you want to have access everywhere for instance in samburu can all the private entities do that on their own or they will need help? So, for instance, we have a line that, that can, I mean, we have a drop-off point or pick-off point that can happen into locations as far off as those. Mm. So, uh, all I'm saying is, for now, we're sticking to building our capability within which we are most competent. Beyond that, it will then need to be a space of what are the gaps identified? Because also, if you just rush into things, creating okay. duplicity. You're learning okay. as you go. Yes. Uh, are we going into a break or can I ask a question? Ask a question. Okay. Two. You have access. Mm -hmm. I'm going to call it capacity. Mm -hmm. You're already offloading and trading and doing business with Safaricom, mm -hmm. Airtel, mm -hmm. Telcom, Telcom mm -hmm. Wananchi, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Zuku, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. These people have reached throughout the country mm -hmm. in places that I don't even know of mm -hmm. simply because there are phones and connectivity everywhere. Mm -hmm. 
I suspect these people pay you mm -hmm. for what you give them, isn't it? Yes. Okay, now. $22 per kilometer. Per kilometer. Per kilometer. Per kilometer. Per mm -hmm. Yes. Now, your CSR doesn't require you to do what the telcos do. Mm -hmm. But the telcos have mm -hmm. the capacity mm -hmm. to influence that connectivity to the very local establishment mm -hmm. or to the furthest corner of this country. Mm -hmm. Now, is it then not possible? Mm -hmm. Even as you make these arrangements, mm -hmm. you say, okay, <clears throat> you've, collect, you've connected, you, Safaricom, you've got 23 kilometers of this thing of ours. Mm -hmm. This three kilometers, mm -hmm. let's tell you what you want you to do with it. Mm -hmm. You, as I, I tell the other guys, and they all the, this is what you want you to do with it. Mm -hmm. Not you. Mm -hmm. You simply say, instead of paying us, mm -hmm. is it possible mm -hmm. for this mm -hmm. to be part of our CSR so that you can provide mm -hmm. what is needed in this and this and this place because mm -hmm. that really isn't your work mm -hmm. but they can do it mm -hmm. is it possible to have discussions around partnering with these people to do what they can do and what they do on a daily basis mm -hmm. anyway mm -hmm. and charge a premium mm -hmm. so that the very thing that ndu was referring to where mm -hmm. in the event god forbid of a situation where we have a covid moment again mm -hmm. life doesn't come to a halt. Mm -hmm. halt that is taken we we had not thought of as far as our possibility, but that is taken because indeed there are possibilities for further collaboration. Yeah. Other ideas. Yes. Let's come back into the general Kenya pipeline conversation. Mm -hmm. People are asking questions. So one is, <coughs> and City has asked this question of the Director General of uh, APRA, has asked this question of uh, various other people. The mm -hmm. former chairman of KPC. Of mm -hmm. uh, Kipevu. Mm -hmm refinery mm -hmm. and the capacity is there a business case mm -hmm. for kenya rebuilding mm -hmm. a refinery mm -hmm. and it making sense mm -hmm. for kenya pipeline mm -hmm. as a business and a revenue stream mm -hmm. <clears throat> as you know that very um innovative um lapset project envisioned a refinery in lamo as an alternative to mombasa because of any potential disruption but also to open up a corridor that we are not actively participating in and that you know is a north uh, <coughs> the horn of africa so as you know the port of lamu has actually already been commissioned for um the first uh, initial baths the one for oil tankers uh not yet it's the refinery construction is also pending and then there's also the the pipeline that's supposed to connect us through to ethiopia it is possible based on demand that a refinery will be built it is in the master plan the only question is when so for now <coughs> considering the dynamism around um <coughs> petroleum products importation pricing we do not have plan to resuscitate that refinery so as you do know we're in the process of acquiring uh the kenya petroleum refineries with the assets that it has for further expansion <coughs> into kenya pipeline Correct. Mm. Into capabilities like liquefied petroleum gas because they mm. have quite a vast uh, amount of storage that is also within the same <coughs> mind space of creating access, reducing cost. Because we've talked so much about kerosene. We've talked so much about biomass that's being wood energy from forests and whatnot. Mm. It is time to incentivize and create opportunity for us to use liquefied petroleum gas for cooking, for lighting, potentially even for manufacturing. So KPRL, that's Kenya Petroleum Refineries, is envisioned very firmly within Kenya Pipeline Company's growth agenda. It is an imperative for us. That means no refining capability on that front. But there are prospects of looking into biorefining for bioethanol blending as we do that as well in places like Kisumu. In Lamu is where we can envision our refinery coming up based on need. But for now, whatever comes through the port of Mombasa is so far sufficient, especially with Kip, um, Kipevo Oil Terminal 2 that's coming up on or offshore that is going to enable bigger ships, bigger, a faster um, displacement, essentially discharge into the sh sh what we call short tanks. These are what are um, at the beach station that's mombasa mm. into uh the hinterland that is all the way upwards to nairobi and western kenya so with this infrastructure in place why would you build a refinery only to run up high costs and not return any sort of margin on your investment mm. as you do know most refineries in the world are shutting down and even the markets that we 
traditionally serve is so far content and to make it even more complex or better for everybody, we built a jetty in Kisumu. So there's waterway transportation. So you come into the pipeline, you either load by truck or load onto a barge into Uganda, potentially into Rwanda and the DRC. So, so far the economics around refining are so much cheaper than the economic, I mean, importation are so much cheaper than the economics around refining. And there are other plans with that refinery. KOT2. Mm -hmm. Um, due to be launched, uh, so it was commissioned, and we remember the president mm -hmm. and um, a Chinese foreign minister mm -hmm. at that site. So, the other question that was also floated so, we have now capacity to offload various a number of ships at the same time. Mm -hmm. Does Kenya Pipeline have the capacity mm -hmm. to store mm -hmm. and move mm -hmm. all that uh, new volume? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Or do you so, need to expand capacity? So, in fact, in ta in Mombasa, there's quite ample capacity. So there's the old petroleum. What is the capacity? Um, at Kosef, Kipebo Oil Storage Facility. I'm sorry, in oil we tend to use so many um, mm -hmm. acronyms. Yeah, yeah, every, every discipline has yeah, Indeed. Yes. Um, at Kipebo, we have about 326,000 meter cube. That would be about 326,000 million liters. But how long would that last in our market? So we have storage capability for 15 to 21 days untouched. Then we have an additional 200, uh, about 40 at what we call potteries. This is just off the shore with um, Kipevu. Mm. These were acquired from Kenya Petroleum Refineries Limited. And then we have what we have in a place called Changamwe, traditionally where the refinery sat. Mm. It's about another 200 odd, 230 odd thousand that was used for crude oil. So those are in the process of conversion. So once all this is done, we will have storage in three three places within Mombasa and then there's also private terminals that used to operate within Shimanzi. So, theoretically in maximum working capacity mm -hmm. how many days stretch would that afford us? Um, definitely taking us to 30. So with the pipeline moving, so assuming in working days where you're assuming the pipeline is operating. But it worked every day. It works every day. I thought you meant like just sitting still. Mm. Um, this product is able to last close to 30 days if we have the additional storage. Without the additional storage, we're working with a turnaround time of 15 days. But the beauty is every single, every other day, there's a vessel discharging. So our import cycle works that at any given time, you have about four to five ships waiting to mm. discharge. But then with the uh, expansion of Kipevu, mm -hmm. it isn't just one. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be three to four terminals, mm -hmm. which means instead mm -hmm. of one ship docking, mm -hmm. you'll have three. Absolutely. Yes. Doing, and doing it simultaneously. Yes, exactly. With dedicated lines and yes. going into the storage terminals. Yes. So what will happen is you'll have some moving into the in hinterland, going upwards into Nairobi and Western Some Kenya. Being up. Exactly. Others being pumped straight to the terminals in Mombasa. Oh. And then others will sit in the tanks for either the people who do not want to lift it at the moment mm. or for strategic um, importance or strategic reserves. Okay. Hey, Asante. Zilpa Michelle Abongo is a general manager of strategy and compliance at the Kenya Pipeline Company. We've been talking about Kenya Pipeline, its strategy going forward, Vision 2025, and what they want to see uh, happening in their business. Plus, they've just launched the fiber optic cable business line of business, and she's been explaining to us all about it. Zilpa, thank you very much for coming. Thank you so come much, again Dean. Soon. Indeed. And yes, we are taking you up on that invitation to mm -hmm. come and see the operations of Kenya Pipeline. Mm -hmm. We'll start from boarding. Mm -hmm. um, she will board and come <laughs> to Kuja na Meli. <laughs> No, no. Kipevu, no. Where we to where we are charged to get to be pipeline. <laughs> it is important to experience the entire pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pun intended. Mm -hmm. Yes. To fix a Mombasa, to work with Kwameli, to end Uganda. And then mm -hmm. walk into a tank and yes. see what a tank is like. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you see how these molecules do not touch each yes. other. That's <laughs> the one I want to see. <laughs> I keep telling everyone says you guys are magicians, but it, 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 it's quite some, it's, um, some beautiful technology. Thank you very much for thank joining you us. Very much, we also team. want to thank our audience on KT and Home who've been thus since the top of the hour. The conversations continue on Spice FM around the country and also on YouTube. Spice FM KE is our YouTube channel and our Facebook page is Spice FM KE. Throw us a comment, a complaint, whatever on Spice FM KE on Twitter or Instagram as well.